Now I take great pleasure in introducing Scott Henkel, who will turn our attention to the past and the future of the University of Wyoming, at once our flagship university and a land-grant institution, a virtually unique combination. Scott is a member of the English department and adjunct faculty member of African American and African Diaspora Studies. I'm pleased to announce that he's been recognized by the College of Arts and Sciences for extraordinary merit in research. And I'm proud to say that he is also the recipient of a summer fellowship from WIRE on the subject of his current talk, the Humanities and the Land Grant University Mission from the 19th to the 21st century. So help me welcome Scott Hinkle. Thank you for coming. A tremendous number of people talked with me and nurtured me and helped me to write and I appreciate all of them very, very much. And thank you, Eric, for all of your hard work over so many years to get us where we are now. In October, a group of us went to Gillette with the Saturday University program. You probably know Saturday University. It's one of these great engagement programs where faculty have conversations with people all over the state about our work and the issues of the day. We had a chance to see some neighborhoods in Gillette. While we were driving around, we heard the story of how, on the last day of the school year last year, people there had rented 600 U-Haul trucks. The people who rented those U-Haul trucks were parents who had lost their jobs in the mines, yet found a way to stay put so their kids could finish the school year. I think that is a breathtaking act of sacrifice. And it makes me ask, what more can the University of Wyoming do to support our communities? How to use the tools of higher education so that people can reach their potential even when times are hard and perhaps especially when times are hard. Those are old questions. They are also questions at the heart of the land-grant university mission. Before we get to that, ooh, wow, I have to say that I can't remember ever being as nervous for a presentation as I am right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, not only are you a very important audience to me, uh, but I don't like it when speakers make themselves the subjects of a presentation. Uh, but I feel an obligation, maybe even a loyalty to those people that I met in Gillette, because like them, my parents made education a priority, even in hard times. Neither of my parents had a college degree. My mother was a school bus driver, and my dad was a worker in a factory that closed and has never reopened. The land-grant universities were designed to be public goods, to serve everybody, specifically including people like me and the people I met in Gillette. Therefore, my hope today is to be helpful, to give something back to the people and the institutions that have done so much for me. But that's also why it's so hard for me not to mix myself up in this project. So I'm going to talk from the evidence and from the heart and hope that that combination carries the day. I'm going to give the theme of my talk now and specific proposals later. While the exact source of this theme remains ambiguous, it's both a description of and a goal for a land-grant university. It is both a representation and an aspiration. It's this. What a land-grant university should provide is an education good enough for the proudest and open to the poorest. What that has meant and what that could mean is our topic today. What follows is a talk in two parts. First, an overview of the relevant history and second, a conversation about how this history can guide us in our work. 
To some, this history will be familiar. To others, it may help explain why a land-grant university works in the way that it does. My goal is to trace this history so that we can, to the degree that we're able, project the land-grant mission into the future. In the first half of the 19th century, schools of law, medicine, and divinity dominated higher education, excluding working class students and students of color by many mechanisms, including tuition rates that were too high and admission requirements that were beyond reach. Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, for example, required applicants to have a knowledge of Latin and Greek well into the 20th century. The early architects of the land-grant university dreamed of a more inclusive institution a democratic model for the university, which would offer a wide and diverse curriculum. However, people laughed at the idea that there should be higher education for the daughters and sons of farmers and workers. Critics said that such students would become book farmers, well prepared to talk about crops, but unprepared actually to grow them. You can hear echoes of those criticisms today. What can literature or philosophy do for a Gillette coal miner or her children? Well, for this son of a bus driver and a factory worker, quite a bit. The establishment of the land-grant universities is a story of how something that seemed impossible became possible. It didn't just happen, and it wasn't the gift of any legislature. In fact, the story of how the land-grant university was established is about how movements of common people demanded an education and then banded together to make their legislatures provide it. To a significant degree, the early architects of the land-grant university were participants in the 19th century movements to abolish slavery, to recognize a woman's right to vote, and to win labor rights. In each of these cases, people in those movements were told that their goals were foolish. They were told that slavery was an ancient institution sanctioned by the Bible. They were told that a woman's place was in the home, not in the voting booths. And they were told that the right to work was enough, regardless of how dangerous that work was or how low its wages were. In response to these arguments, Jonathan Baldwin Turner, one of the land-grant university's major early proponents, wrote that such doubters were like, quote, relentless donkeys holding back the great car of social and moral progress, braying at every new idea that dawns upon the world. <laughs> <clears throat> With lovely sentences like that one, it should not be surprising to learn that Turner was a professor of rhetoric and belles lettres. If he were an ac academic today, he would likely be in the English department. Or maybe the sociology department, I don't know. What would it be? Turner was trained at Yale and taught at Illinois College. He participated in the first meeting of the organization that would, become the, that would become the Republican Party in that state. He was also the editor of an abolitionist newspaper, The Statesman. For his abolitionist writings, he was threatened with assassination. For his proposal to establish universities for the common people, his barn was burned, killing all of his animals and destroying his tools. In 1848, Turner was pressured to resign his faculty opinion, his, his faculty position, proving that there have always been, and perhaps always will be, powerful people who want to penalize the university for unpopular opinions. Turner was one of many participants in the early movement to establish what were then called industrial universities for the people. But he was one of the movement's main organizers responsible for coordinating the many state-level initiatives into a national movement and for writing and compiling the various proposals. This text was one of the movement's main tools. The idea was that these industrial universities for the people would belong to everyone that both access to and the curriculum at the land-grant university should be universal. This is the gist of a university good enough for the proudest and open to the poorest, a continual negotiation between quality and equality. On the question of access, Turner wrote in the pamphlet that the university, quote, was given to the people, the whole people of the state, not for a class, a party, or a sect, or a conglomeration of sects." 
Even though the people who work and study at the university are responsible for its practical management, the university belongs to the whole state. Its current and future students, the retirees who take continuing education classes, the backyard gardener who goes to the extension office to get information on how to grow tomatoes, the fans who come to see a game on a Saturday. The land-grant university belongs to all of us. On the question of the curriculum, there has been much confusion. Turner writes, quote, the objects of these institutes should be to apply existing knowledge directly and efficiently to all practical pursuits and professions in life and to extend the boundaries of our present knowledge in all possible practical directions, unquote. People get tripped up on the word practical and often miss the broader point about extending the boundaries of our knowledge in all possible directions. This is further complicated by the repetition in much of the scholarship of demeaning comments about classical education, specifically in Latin and Greek. Those comments criticized what I mentioned earlier, the use of the classics as a tool to exclude working class applicants. Those comments were not meant to exclude any area of study. As Turner wrote, quote, no species of knowledge should be excluded, practical or theoretical. <laughs> Unless indeed it be those specimens of organized ignorance found in the creeds of party politicians and sectarian ecclesiastics. Unquote. <laughs> There's a good reason to have a wide and diverse curriculum. The problems we face in a democracy are ones we often cannot predict. We need an educated public prepared for a broad range of possibilities, some of which we can't see right now. Turner persuaded the Republican representative, later Senator, Justin Morrill of Vermont, to propose federal legislation to found the land-grant universities. Turner also, during the 1862 election campaign, secured the promise of both Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas to sign that legislation, thus securing its passage, regardless of who would win the election. But again, it took a movement to build these universities. In 1850, 12 years before the Morrill Land Grant Act was passed, the Michigan Constitution created Michigan Agricultural College, now Michigan State University. It was the first land grant college and, in many ways, the prototype for what we have now. In 1855, the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania was chartered, which is now Penn State University. On July 2nd, 1862, during the Civil War, and after about 20 years of movement organizing, President Lincoln signed the first Morrill Land Grant Act into law. If you ever need a reason to get out of bed in the morning, to come to work, remember that Lincoln signed the Morrill Act as he was writing the Emancipation Proclamation. The Morrill Act stated that universities should be built within two years, but nearly none were. The demands of the Civil War delayed initial efforts. And problems multiplied from there. After the end of the Civil War, the states of the old slaveocracy were slow to build universities for poor whites and free people. But perhaps this just wasn't the fault of the old slaveocracy. For many whites in the 19th century, it was possible to be both against slavery and also against equal rights for blacks. This was Lincoln's position to say nothing of his successor, Andrew Johnson, and it was also Turner's. But after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, the task of building these universities passed to other hands. Reconstruction was not just the process of building new brick and mortar, but also of rebuilding the nation along lines that many people hoped would be more equal and more free. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that in this era, quote, there was an opportunity for real and new democracy in America." Unquote. People in this era talked about substantive freedom, by which they meant not just the right to live free from oppression, but also to have the tools that citizens need in order to exercise that freedom. As Vivek Chibber writes, quote, there are many things that people need to live decent lives, but two items are absolutely essential. The first is some degree of material security, things like having an income, housing, and health care. The second is being free from social domination. If you're under someone else's control, 
If they make many of the key decisions for you, then you are constantly vulnerable to abuse. Close quote. That's a multifaceted problem, of course, <coughs> but it was an immediately pressing issue during Reconstruction. Education is not a foolproof solution, but without an education, citizens are far less well-equipped to combat a world full of schemes and tricks. We have always been about empowerment, the process of turning vulnerability into agency. The University of Wyoming and the Wyoming State Constitution are products of Reconstruction. In many ways, when they were established, they were ahead of the game. I'll return to that in a moment. In 1877, the Hatch Act provided federal funds to establish agricultural experiment stations. In 1890, a second land-grant act was passed specifically designed to serve the population of ex-slaves and their children. This law mandated race-blind admissions and was responsible for creating many of our current historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. That is an interesting and largely unrecognized fact, that there is a historical link between what are now called the land-grant universities and which were once called the 1890 land-grant universities, but now HBCUs. In 1914, the Smith-Lever Act was passed. This established the Cooperative Extension Service, and it was arguably the first piece of federal legislation explicitly aimed at the education of women. Native American tribally controlled colleges and universities received land-grant status in 1994. There are now also federally funded programs for sea grant and space grant programs, some of which we participate in here. So, we got to where we are now through a long and difficult path. It's important to know the legislation, but only to focus there can obscure the many efforts made by ordinary people. As one early participant in the movement said, in order to establish the land-grant university, quote, convention after convention was held, league after league was formed, society after society was organized. Pamphlets, appeals, and addresses were written and published by tens of thousands of copies. Petitions and memorials went up from the lakes to the sea. The lawmaking power was involved, and earnest, determined people thundered again and again at the doors of the General Assemblies and Congressional Halls, demanding to be heard on this great question. At times, in some of the states, the issue went to the hustings, and even the tumultuous roar of political parties was awed and hushed for a time by the great voice of the toiling masses demanding an education suited to their needs." Close quote. To sum up a bit before we move on, there are two points to remember about this history. The first is that the land-grant university was not a gift on high bestowed upon grateful people, although I am grateful. Rather, it was dreamed of and then built by common people who worked together in order to create the type of higher education they wanted against the noise of donkeys braying. Second, as the land-grant university mission evolved through a series of laws, it corrected past mistakes and became more inclusive. So what first seemed impossible, but then possible, is now our reality. We are here on this beautiful campus because movements of people first dreamed and then demanded that it be so. I need not convince any of you that we here at the University of Wyoming do important work all across the state but by no means is our current system perfect. We ought to serve more people than we do. We have too easily let others pretend as if they, not we, are the real defenders of our students. Every one of us has heard the stereotypes too. Scary college professors indoctrinating our students, or students who care more about beer and circuses than they do about studying. Turner's biographer writes that the land-grant universities were often called Turner's Folly, and that, quote, cartoons appeared in the daily and weekly papers showing professors in high silk hats and kid gloves out in the fields holding plow handles in the most awkward and ungainly way, unquote. 
These stereotypes are mostly peddled by small minds who, if they had any interest in doing so, would find that lazy thinking wilts under the sunlight of actual evidence. The issue is that those claims, repeated so often, deceive many sincere people who would otherwise want the university to succeed. Those arguments, those arguments, together with the drumbeat for tax cuts, with its false promise that a person can get something for nothing, have led to an atmosphere in which cuts to the university have done real damage to the land-grant mission and to public education in general. Relentless cuts hamstring our sense of what could be possible. Cuts make it difficult to carry out our mission. Those difficulties then become a justification for yet more cuts, ad infinitum. In that atmosphere, we have often attacked one another the humanities, against the sciences, against the professions, instead of striving for something higher. The result is predictable. Universities increasingly rely on the labor of poorly paid adjuncts and graduate employees rather than on full-time faculty. The strategic defunding of the university has done real damage to students. Nationwide, in the last five years, student loan borrowing has actually fallen slightly. But this small fall is only a slight glimmer of good news. In 1970 to 71, education loans in the United States totaled $7.6 billion. In 2000 to 2001, the total was $52.4 billion. And over the next decade, that number doubled to $120 billion. Today, approximately 42 million Americans have student loan debt. The total amount that they owe is approximately $1.3 trillion. Trillion dollars. I am among them. <laughs> Uh, so this is a topic on which I can speak with some authority. Uh, to quote the philosopher Bruce Springsteen, I got debts that no honest man can pay. I am very proud, therefore, to work here at the University of Wyoming, where the average student debt is lower than it is nationally and also compared to our peers. We have a history that has bucked national trends, but there's more to be done. In what follows, I have two proposals. One piece of legislation I mentioned a moment ago is the 1914 Smith-Lever Act. In my judgment, the genius of Smith-Lever is threefold. It was arguably the first piece of federal legislation explicitly aimed at educating women. And it is one of the under-recognized successes of the women's suffrage movement. Second, it recognizes that a distinction can be made between the funds necessary to produce research and the funds necessary to disseminate that research. And third, it recognizes that part of the process of producing research is engaging people in conversations. To do all this practically, the Smith-Lever Act established the Cooperative Extension Service. Here in Wyoming, we have extension offices in every county and two in Fremont, Lincoln, and Park counties. Smith-Lever is the primary mechanism for much of our engagement work. The cooperative extension offices provide assistance for a range of activities, from adult learning to cultural programming to classes on how to can fruits and vegetables. There sits Dr. Issa Helfgott, Associate Professor of History here at UW. An, education, an educator from the Cooperative Extension Service gave her grandmother, an Iowa farmer, a reproduction of a painting by Renoir. That image made its way from that farmhouse to her childhood bedroom and then into her dissertation. Dr. Helfgott credits that gift as one thing that inspired her to become the scholar that she is today. Extension offices often have classes on healthy choices for people who qualify for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, 
more commonly known as food stamps. Let me tell you, because I've seen it firsthand as I've talked with people to write this presentation, an organization that helps to feed both the mind and the body is a powerful thing, one that makes real improvements in the lives of the people it serves. What is also remarkable about the Smith Lever Act is that it provides funds for the conversations around the state necessary to produce knowledge and to give that knowledge away for free or as nearly free as possible. Let's be precise on this point. Knowledge is expensive to produce. The preparation that goes into training a master teacher is considerable. The equipment necessary to look deep into the stars or deep into the earth is costly. Experiments fail, peer-reviewed papers are rejected and revised, and all of this comes with a price tag. But let me give you an example of how this engagement works. At this very moment, if a backyard gardener anywhere in Wyoming wanted to learn how to grow tomatoes, she can call her county extension office and get expert advice tested by specialists here at UW. She can try it out, see what works and what doesn't, and when she discovers something that improves the planting or pruning or yield, she can share back with us. Those conversations can produce high quality information. When she's successful, she'll likely have more than she can use for her and her family, and then, presto, the whole neighborhood gets tomatoes. For free, or as nearly free as possible. Tomatoes are an excellent example, but they're just one of many. What more can a land-grant university do to serve its communities? That's a model to follow. In my understanding, there are ongoing discussions about whether we should become a Carnegie engaged institution. I fully support this. This classification, quote, describes collaboration between institutions of higher education and their larger communities for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in a context of partnership and reciprocity, close quote. If that language sounds familiar, it's because it's a good definition of our engagement efforts. What I would propose, however, is not just an affirmation and recognition of what we're already doing, although it is always good to recognize people for the work that they do, but also a profound expansion of our engagement. So that's my first proposal. A substantive investment following the logic of the Smith Lever Act in the work of the faculty to engage the state in conversations provide the necessary time and funds to make our research and engagement some order of magnitude greater than it is now. If there's a person in the state who doubts our value, let's go show them. My other proposal returns to the idea of student access and debt. Remember that one of the pillars of the land-grant ideal is that the institution would serve a population that has never previously been served and not just to grant them access, but also to give them the necessary tools with which to succeed. To paraphrase the 19th century abolitionist David Walker, expecting a student with inadequate support to, su to succeed just as well as one with adequate support is like commanding two dogs to run, one of which is in a cage. Here at UW, we have kept academic support quite high and costs for students comparatively low. Much of that support comes from the faculty and staff in programs like Synergy, Student Success Services, and Multicultural Affairs, working to ensure that when our students arrive, they have the opportunity to reach their potential. An important reason for our low costs, although not the only reason, is that we here in Wyoming have been guided by the genuine wisdom of the people who wrote our Constitution. Here's the relevant language. Tuition free. The university shall be equally open to students of both sexes, irrespective of race or color. And, in order that the instruction furnished may be as nearly free as possible, any amount in addition to the income from its grants of lands and other sources above mentioned 
necessary to its support and maintenance in a condition of full efficiency shall be raised by taxation or otherwise under provisions of the legislature. Close quote. Let me guard here against being misunderstood. Constitutions don't protect themselves. Rather, people make constitutions into either living or dead documents. Our legislature has worked hard over many years to keep this promise to our students. Compare Wyoming's experience to Arizona, the state constitution of which has nearly exactly the same language. Quote, the university and all other state educational institutions shall be open to students of both sexes, and the instruction furnished shall be nearly free as possible, close quote. Yet at their land-grant university, the University of Arizona, costs have soared. We have made different choices of which we can be proud. But our situation requires eternal vigilance. You may have seen the news some months ago that the largest student loan servicer in the country, Navient, revealed in court documents that in its view, quote, there is no expectation that the servicer will act in the interests of the customer, close quote. Let me translate that from corporate speak into plain English. <laughs> the largest student loan servicer in the country has publicly stated that when the interests of the corporation come into conflict with the interests of students, the corporation will put its interests first. Here is data from UW's Office of Academic Affairs about our students' debt. The brown color represents in-state and the gold is out-of-state. As you can see, about 55% of our undergraduates carry no student loan debt whatsoever for a variety of reasons. That is remarkable. Of the remaining 45% of students who do graduate with debt, they have an average of $21,518 which is below the national average and below what students have at our peer institutions. That too is remarkable, but it's insufficient. One issue that we're facing is that too many of our kids leave the state after graduation. Many factors cause this, of course. But one is that although students generally graduate with low debt, the average wage for college graduates in Wyoming is correspondingly low at about $40,000 a year. Compare this, for example, to the average wage in Colorado, which is $45,000 a year, or nationally, which is $51,000 a year, and the issue becomes apparent. I know, this is a complex problem, one that also includes the issue of what jobs are available here in Wyoming. But on this one piece of it, let me say it plainly. Our students can graduate with debt that's here and stay in Wyoming where the average wage is here. Or they can go to another state where the average wage is here and pay off their debt more easily. Our students are smart. They've figured this out faster than we have. To my knowledge, there's no one in this room who can raise the average wage in the state. But there are many people in this room who can influence the policy of the university so that students graduate with less debt. So, what about this? Over the next X number of years, you set the target. We aim to increase the percentage of students who graduate without debt from 55%, where it is now, to 75%. Over the years after that, we increase the percentage of debt-free students to 100% and achieve the very lofty goal of being able to say to a prospective student, you will have skin in this game, and you will have to work hard, both in the classroom and in some sort of work-study job or waiting tables or whatever, to pay your share. But if you do that, we will help you to stand on stage at graduation without any student loan debt. Not only will that protect our students from loan profiteers who would mortgage their future, it will protect our mission. It will reaffirm our ideal of a democratic university. 
It will keep us in compliance with the spirit of Wyoming's constitution, and it will make our commitment to accessibility a material reality. Furthermore, it will create a farm team of future donors, grateful for what we've done for them, whose loyalty will help to diversify and stabilize how the university is funded. In 1870, looking back on things accomplished and forward to work yet to be done, Jonathan Baldwin Turner said, quote, it will probably take a thousand years for a single one of these great free states to learn to endow and manage these universities in the best possible manner. <laughs> but what of that? Shall we never attempt to learn the greatest of all possible arts? The preparing of our American youth for a true American life? Because our art is difficult and our lesson a long one? Was he right or what? We're about 150 years into that thousand year span and we're still trying hard to figure out the best way forward. It is evident to me, as I've been working on this talk, that many people here care deeply about our work and want us to succeed. What could Wyoming's land grant mission mean in the 21st century? How best to provide an education good enough for the proudest and open to the poorest? You tell me. I've laid out a history, and I've tried to project from that history into our moment, focusing on some of the aspects I feel need our closest attention. But the university belongs to all of us. We have to figure it out together. Faculty, students, staff, trustees, legislators, and friends. None of this will be easy. What we choose to do, some may say, is impossible. We will make mistakes. But what seems impossible now may become possible and may even be the reality for the generation after us. Who are we to say that the tasks we face are too hard? The question is whether the work is worth the effort. As I mentioned earlier, the architects of the land-grant university talked about substantive freedoms. To be substantively free is to have all the rights and responsibilities of free people and the tools necessary to exercise that freedom. In the 19th century, if a person could be bought and sold as property, freedom meant nothing, even to those who were not themselves enslaved. Without the ballot, citizenship meant nothing. But these tools, together with the possibility of a high quality, universally inclusive education, are part of what makes that freedom substantive. That was as true in the 19th century as it is in the 21st. Whether we choose to pursue it, against the noise of donkeys braying in the background, is one of the questions for our generation. That freedom is a lofty goal, and I hope we do choose to pursue it. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Marlon. So I think one of the, the questions that I have is that in my opinion, and this may be hopefully scientific, these numbers are misleading. And as you talk about the two dogs that commanded the run, one was in a cage. So the question I would ask is who's carrying the debt? When you break it down to income level, when you break it down to yeah. uh, unrepresented groups, yeah. who's carrying the debt? So yes, we may increase to 75% if the same people are carrying the debt. Have we really made an institution that is, as you uh, quoted, open to the borders? That's excellent not only on uh, uh, the exit, like who graduates with debt at graduation, but also on the question of access, which I, which I hoped to have implied strongly, but now I will say explicitly, is one of the jobs for a land-grant university is really to make sure that the poorest can come and do come, right? Uh, uh, so it's sort of two directions to the same question, right? Uh, 
as you would expect, who carries debt? The poor students, right? Uh, but that's not completely true. That's not completely true. One of, the, one of the things that makes it hard is that on the FAFSA, you know, the, uh, 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 the application, the free application for federal student aid, whatever, uh, uh, the assumption that that makes is that a student whose family can contribute will contribute. And that's not always the case, right? Uh, in fact, that's very often not the case. So I think it's substantially true, of course, to think that the poorest students will carry the most debt, but that's not the full story. Interestingly enough, many middle class kids and upper class kids are also carrying a bunch of debt. Uh, uh, do the middle class kids and the wealthy kids carry such debt because they'll have a higher likelihood of paying it off in the future? Yeah, likely, likely. Uh, uh, but one of the reasons why I proposed the idea of getting to zero debt is that the closer we approach that goal, the fairer we are across the board. Yeah. Would you be willing to comment on the rainy day fund? And I why it's not, you know, the Wyoming Rainy Day Fund? Yeah, I am. Yeah. The question is, am I willing to comment on the Rainy Day Fund? And the answer to that question is, yes. <laughs> now you want me to comment on the Rainy Day Fund? Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, uh, I, I get it. I understand. I understand the, the impulse to be protective when times are hard. I get that. I fully, fully understand that. I also get the counter argument to that, which is investment in hard times pays out dividends far greater than saving. That, as I understand it, are the two poles to the argument. One is save so that if times ever really do get harder than they are now, which is a possibility, that things can be saved for that day. The other argument, as I understand it, is uh, uh, it's raining. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, it's raining. Yes. That's the that's the counter argument to that position. Uh, uh, one would have to check this. Uh, uh, I am an English professor, so therefore words come to me with greater facility than do numbers. Uh, but my understanding is that there is research out there that has shown what the return on investment is for every single dollar spent on higher education. Uh, what is that here in Wyoming? It may be that there's somebody in the room who knows the answer to that question. If so, signal to me what it is. But my understanding is that generally speaking, I think there's been studies done at the University of Texas and Texas A&M that has showed something like for every dollar spent on higher education, the return on investment is something like $100. Check that, right? I mean, check, check to see if those numbers are out there and whether that's true. And of course, somebody ought to do a study, if it hasn't been done already, it probably has been done already, and I just don't know about it, uh, about what the return on investment is for every education dollar spent here. So, where do I stand on the question? Perhaps that's the real nub of the issue. It seems to me to make very good, reasonable sense to spend when we have such a high return on investment, especially when times are hard. Can times get harder than they are now? Yes. But I have spent my entire career, which is not as long as some, but longer than others, under the atmosphere of relentless cuts to the university. I have never known work in higher education that was not under the specter of some kind of cut. I don't know when that will end. But one of the things that I hope to strongly imply out of the history of the movement that built the land-grant university is that movements of people built it. Many people care about it. To protect it and to extend it, it's also going to take the efforts of many, many people working together. How's that? One of the really powerful pieces of your presentation, Scott, is when you start to talk about the relationship between land grants and historically black colleges yeah, right. and universities. And I'd like you to talk 
for a moment, if you can, about at a moment when we are going through strategic planning, like thinking forward, how can we honor those relationships and cultivate them better? And is that part of the future we should be looking for? So first of all, the uh, funding that the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research has very graciously given me will support research. This, what I gave you today is the result of uh, book research, library research, and the conversations with many people uh, uh, here, right? Uh, but what WIRES funding will do this summer is to send me to archives at Howard University and the University of Illinois, in part, to get a better answer to that question. Uh, my understanding is that in maybe one of the strategic plan drafts, there's a proposal to increase the correspondence between faculty here and faculty at one or more of the HBCUs. Something like that? Very good. I totally support that. I would want to participate in that program. Interestingly enough, the history of the land-grant university and the history of the HBCUs uh, uh, sort of looks like two upside down triangles in a way as far as I've been able to tell. The land grant universities begin from movements of farmers and workers, right? Many of the HBCUs begin from movements of ex-slaves and their children, building universities each for their own needs, and they come together at this interesting moment in 1890 well after Reconstruction, interestingly enough. The most historians date the end of Reconstruction to 1877 or so, right? Uh, but here it is, what? 13 years after the end of Reconstruction. Did I get that math right? Yeah, yeah okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 13 years after the end of Reconstruction, uh, there's this interesting moment of conversion between the land-grant university and uh, uh, the HBCUs that are going to be newly created. Many of the HBCUs, of course, existed before 1890, yeah, as you well know. Uh, uh, what I would want to see is as strong as possible a connection between the land-grants and the HBCUs because they are among the most important institutes historically, really to empower people. And what I said earlier was, we've always been about empowerment, the process of moving from vulnerability to agency. That can equally be said about the HBCUs, and I think it's a very powerful alliance, one which we should nurture in every way possible. Yes, please. The thing that's missing from your talk is the realization that Wyoming, uniquely, is not just a land-grant institution, but is also a flagship institution. And uh, in the first part of your talk, you, were, you, were, you, were, uh, you, you put forward this model of, of, of faculty going out to the state and engaging in conversations, and that segues to uh, for lack of a better term, a sort of a dissonance that I think is growing between the land-grant mission at Wyoming and the flagship mission at Wyoming. Yeah. How do you resolve that dissonance? Uh, because some of us who are involved or researching topics that may not be applicable to a farmer in wherever, um, you know, that's, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear how you Resolve that. Uh, two points. One, uh, you said that your research might not be relevant to some farmer out there somewhere. And maybe that's true, but I doubt it is. I'm a working class kid, right? My mom was a school bus driver and my dad was a factory worker. I have heard for every moment that I've been part of higher education, what do people like you do? Are you interested in the same things that we are? And probably the answer to that question is yes, I am, to a far greater degree than people would like to realize. So, does your research have relevance to some farmer out there somewhere? You would have to ask that farmer. Point number two is that on, on the specific distinction between the role of a land-grant university and the role of the state flagship, Many of the state flagships out there are public in name only, 
right? I mean, they, I think, uh, check this, somebody with a phone and access to Google or whatever. Uh, but my understanding is that places like the University of Michigan and the University of Virginia, I mean, beautiful, wonderful, flagship public universities, now get something like 4% of their total budget from public funds. Correct? Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, that's right? Okay, good. I have confirmation that that is, in fact, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, substantially so. Uh, uh, correct, correctly sourced uh, by my colleagues right there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, does that even make them public anymore? Question mark. Right? I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what a funding model for a public university would look like going into the 24th, 24th, <laughs> uh, 21st century, not, let alone the 24th century. Uh, uh, but, here, but here's one of the things that I am aware of that I think is very, very important. Uh, as I, as I uh, said earlier about the, the comment on student debt and the degree to which Wyoming's legislature has kept the promise to our students of free tuition or nearly free as possible, we here have a tremendous amount of support from our state which is totally out of proportion to what many other states have done, for which I am thankful because I think that's important. As I said, the university belongs to everyone. What is the mechanism to make the university belong to everyone? To have everyone support it. What? Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. I'm trying to get a sense, big picture nationwide, if there's been a waxing and a waning of this funding, and under what circumstances do each of those have? It would be interesting for me to have numbers. But one of the things I know, and one of the reasons why I use the phrase strategic defunding of the universities, is that once Reconstruction was beaten, one of the things that happened was that funding to the new colleges to serve the population of ex-slaves and their children plummeted, right? It, it, was a, it was a moment when, after the Civil War, in the decades after the Civil War, people couldn't you know, publicly say, well, I no longer support that. That's over, although, of course, people did, right? Uh, uh, but to say, I support you, but I'm going to cut your funding, is a way to appear as if you are fiscally responsible, or whatever phrase you want to use, without actually being so. So uh, it will be interesting for me as I go into the archives this summer to uh, maybe, I don't know, I've never written an article or a book that actually has a chart in it. Maybe I can write an article that actually has a chart in it. I often use words, not charts. But it would be, Janice, very interesting to know what was the precise nature of that strategic defunding. That it was defunded, I know, in that era. Its nature and scope, I'll tell you when I find out. Uh, uh, there were two more, please. You mentioned Latin and Greek, which leads me to recall the early history of this university, yes. as I understand it. The accounts uh, of students arriving on campus were, were quite similar. Uh, they came from the ranch, they got a job on campus, they studied the classics right along with grasses and forbs. So what, do you have a sense of what happened to the assumption that the classics and other humanities were perfectly appropriate for rural working students. Two things on that. Uh, one, I have a quote for you that I would have loved to put in the text of the presentation, uh, but whatever. I, I figured that, you know, 38 minutes was long enough already, and you people are very kind with your patience. <clears throat> uh, in a book that is famous to us all, T.A. Larson's History of Wyoming, he writes, quote, the secretary of the first board of trustees was the versatile editor James W. Hayford, who transferred to the university level his passion for utilitarian education. On May 1, 1866, in his newspaper report of the first board meeting, he set the tone, writing, 
While not ignoring the benefits of classical education, the board recognizes the fact that the world has more use for engineers, mining, civil, gas, electrical engineers, for architects, chemists, and mechanics than it has for men who can merely cackle Greek. <laughs> Close quote. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other thing that I have, so Turner, right, uh, when one of the most important people in the movement to establish the land-grant universities was himself a professor of classics, was himself a professor of uh, Bell's Lettres. He taught his classes at Illinois College in Latin and Greek. Uh, he was unceremoniously fired from that position for opinions that many people thought were unpopular, but we might say now that was one smart guy. Did he have some hostility to his former employer and his former, he redid his life, basically, after being fired from his position, strategically resigning from his position. So did, did that experience help him to have some degree of hostility against Latin and Greek? I mean, that may be, that may be one thing that I find when I go into the archives. But, but here's, I think, the, the better and more factual answer to your question. Uh, uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, through the first couple of decades of the 20th century, people in sciences fields broadly invested to a crazy degree in the land-grant universities, right? So there was an influx of all sorts of scientific, technical money coming into the university. So did the uh, uh, earlier ideas about men cackling in Greek combine with the new money coming in from the sciences to create a situation in which science would be heavily favored against the humanities? I think that's likely. But were we always a part of it? Were the humanities always a central part to the mission? Absolutely, positively, yes. If you want one last piece of evidence, the building that we now call Old Main was not always called Old Main. The building that we now call Old Main was called Languages Hall. The very first building built here was built for what we now call the humanities. As you were talking, I was thinking about national parks, and I think part of that was sort of Ken Burns, America's greatest idea, and that what we need is a Ken Burns documentary on, you know, land grant <laughs> universities. One of those heads that get But the reason I think it's interesting attacks on, on, oh, yes. um, on national parks and on, on designated mm -hmm. monuments and that same real tension between what we see on those signs when we're driving down the road that say land of many uses, right? So you can have the sublime and you can go for oil and, and we, want, we want it both, right? So I, I guess my question is, do you see parallels between national parks and land rights in this day and age? Uh, I might uh, uh, expand that question uh, just slightly and say, do I see parallels between the defunding of all things public? <laughs> There's your answer. There's your answer, right? Uh, if anyone in this room at this late date is still somehow unfamiliar with the decades-long attempt to defund all things public, Go to that beautiful library that's right over there because there is endless literature on that thing and believe me, it will open your eyes. I don't mean to pretend as if we are in a corner being attacked. We have far more power than that. In fact, we have far more power than we often admit to ourselves. One of the things that I hope to have happened tonight is that people leave that door with their spines stiffened. We have more power than we often give ourselves credit for. This is not the first time we've been in a situation where all things public have been defunded. There have been successes and there have been failures, and I hope as we move forward there are even more successes and fewer failures. But yes, if anyone is somehow at this late date still unaware of the fact that all things public are under assault, you're aware now.
Yes, please. We'd like to welcome everyone to look at the UW Extension website and thank you for <laughs> featuring UW Extension publications, which are available free. <laughs> and the reason there are two Extension offices in Fremont County is that one is on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, what obligations does a land grant university have to making connections within the state to try and keep students within the state? Um, and I guess what I mean by that is I went to a university in Louisiana. They had partnerships throughout the state to try and you know make meaningful connections for you know their brightest students to encourage them to find. You mentioned that gap between what they can earn. Is, is, is there any uh, history of doing that outside of Louisiana? Because that's all I know. What does one do to the heart of a 21-year-old college graduate to stop her or him from going out and seeing the big wide world? I don't know that anyone has that power anywhere. But having said that, there are push factors and pull factors. There are factors that push people away from a place, and there are pull factors that bring people into a place. And I sincerely believe that one of the things that we can do is lower our students' debt so that they at least have a broader range of choices. Right? It, to, see, to see a job offer from somewhere out there that is significantly higher to any job offer that they have in here and our students are smart, right? What would you do in such a situation? Whoosh. Having said that, there are, there are initiatives, uh, some of which I think have a greater success probability than others. Uh, maybe you saw the news some time ago uh, that the state of New York has just begun this proposal to have free tuition for all its, graduate, or for all its students uh, uh, at its state universities. And I haven't read that proposal closely, but one, one, one thing that I understand to be the case is that it comes with the string attached that a graduate that hasn't paid tuition has to stay in the state for X number of years. Yes, is that right? Four years. How many? Four. four years. A graduate has to stay in the state for four years. Otherwise, what happens? What's the, do they have to pay off? I think they've got a penalty. Yeah, they get a penalty of some sort. And one wonders if that penalty will be tantamount to the full freight of paying for their education, you know, which is a bait and switch, which I, th which I think is going to fail, right? Uh, some graduate is going to go out there and get a job and uh, work for, let's say, three years and then get accepted into some great graduate school and leave in the fourth year. And then all of a sudden they're freighted with all of that debt that they thought they weren't going to have to pay. Uh, who's going to like that? Nobody. So it's a good idea to think about various proposals, uh, but there are ways to do it smarter than others. And the reason that I made the proposal that I did was that it's best to come through that at the idea of student debt and us buying down the cost in some way so that we move from the level of student debt we have now to even lesser levels of student debt in the future. Yes, sir. I'd just like to point out that we tend to view this identity of land grant and flagship <laughs> as a detriment, as something that says we are internally inconsistent. Yeah. And I would like to make the argument that we should view it as a strength where we are the only state that actually can use its flagship to push the important characters of the land grant mission. Yes. On the topic of letting other people define ourselves and define us negatively, what to do? You pick up the definition that you make for yourself and you advocate for it. Uh, for a time I taught at some very expensive private university which shall not be named and they hated me. I mean they hated kids like me, right? Have I ever felt alienated from higher education as a working class kid? Yes. Have I felt it in many places? Yes. But places like this were meant for everybody including people like me, and that is a representation of ourselves of which we can be tremendously proud. Thank you very much.
President Laura Nichols. I just wanted to just say a quick word of especially huge thanks to Scott for preparing this lecture and doing it, and thanks to Eric for opening the door through the Humanities Research Institute. It's, it's much appreciated. I have to tell you this little story because it's kind of funny. Scott and Eric came to see me, and I think it was the end of January or early February, and they actually came to see me to ask for money but they left with no money but the commitment to doing this lecture tonight. So <laughs> it was quite an interesting meeting. <laughs> but as we were visiting about it, and actually it was, it, they were asking for some funds for Scott to travel so he could, do, he could get to some libraries and do some of this research. We worked it out, don't worry. But at any rate, uh, when I heard what his research is about, I said, would you do a lecture for our campus? Because at that point, I'd been here th about six months-ish, maybe seven, and I just felt our campus was so hungry for a lecture like this. What is the role of the humanities in a land-grant and flagship university? And in fact, I was anxious to hear it too, because I have my convictions, and that is that a land-grant university and humanities go together, and there's a huge role for humanities to play at a land-grant university, and I was excited for this to come out. So, and I, I'm sorry I missed the very beginning of Scott's talk. I was next door at a very exciting budget hearings, but I walked in the door and he literally was saying this and I just was so happy to hear it and I want to repeat it, that he said, sometimes when we get into this angst of cutting budgets, that we tend to pit one discipline or one college or two units against each other. And I think that's in fact true. I've seen that happen. And I just wanted to reiterate what he said is, is that we need to rise above that. And we need to make sure that we don't do that at the University of Wyoming because in fact, we all have a role to play here. Great land grant and flagship universities have strong disciplines across the board coming from many different aspects of academe, social science, humanities, the sciences, the professional schools, and so forth. We need to hold them all up because we need strong disciplines everywhere on this campus. And I so hope in the next strategic plan, you see that we will drive that. So thank you so much for coming tonight. We'll continue this conversation. And again, our deepest thanks, Scott, for putting this together. Much, much appreciated. Thank you.